Cool. All right. That's out of the way. Cool. Cool. All right. Oh, look at that. I forgot to mute the site. There we go. All right, it's two o'clock, so I think we can get started. Okay, welcome to module two of CIS 75. This module is all about malware. And it's a fun one too. There are different kinds of malware. Uh, malware is really just a short, shortened of malicious software. It's software that has entered a computer without the user's knowledge or consent and performs unwanted or harmful action. Malware is the general term that refers to a wide variety of damaging software programs grouped into family of features. But the big note is modern malware utilizes various features in their attacks and they can no longer fit into a single family. So while in this module, we're gonna talk about various families, please note that modern malware is not easily assignable because they have various features from the different families that we're gonna talk about. So it's no longer that a single piece of malware is one thing or is another. It really, they are now more sophisticated and have a mix of the various things we're gonna talk about. So while it's good that we're gonna cover those different families, it's just modern malware just doesn't fit in these boxes anymore. So the first group that we're gonna talk about is the circulation family, starting with viruses. This malware family trait is, is a spreading rapidly to other systems to impact as many as possible through means such as USB drives or email attachments. The two subcategories to them are viruses and worms. Viruses act like their biological counterparts in reproducing themselves on the same computer without any human interaction. They infect computer files either an executable or a user-created data file. When the program is launched or the file is opened, the virus is activated. One of the most common is a macro virus found in Microsoft Office files. Viruses cannot spread across the network. They depend on the actions of users to spread. Different kinds of viruses that exists are the appender. A virus will attach or append itself to the end of an infected file. It inserts a jump at the beginning of a file to itself so that the malicious code is processed before the legitimate content of the file. Another form is the Swiss cheese infection. Viruses will encrypt their code to make it difficult to detect along with the function itself to decrypt. Then divide the code in parts throughout a file. When that file is read or executed, those pieces are strung back together, decrypted, and then executed. There's also split infection. Viruses will split their code into several parts and place them at random positions in the infected file. They could also add garbage code to mask their true purpose. Viruses will change on the fly every time they are opened or executed. In either case, the virus will unload a payload to perform a malicious action 
like deleting files, preventing programs from launching, stealing data, causing system crash, turning off security settings, and then reproduce itself by inserting its code into another file. Worms, the second subcategory of the circulation family, are malicious programs that use the network to replicate. They are designed to enter a computer through the network and take advantage of a vulnerability in an application or an operating system. When one device is exploited, it searches for another with the same vulnerability. They can also leave a payload to cause harm, delete files, or allow the victim to be controlled remotely by an attacker. The next family tree is the infection, starting with the Trojan horse. Named after the Greek legend, Trojan horses are executable programs that masquerade as performing a benign activity, but also do something malicious. A special type of Trojan horse is a remote access Trojan, otherwise known as a rat. These have the basic functionality of a Trojan and give the attacker unauthorized and unrestricted remote access to the victim's computer through the network and even through the internet. Ransomware prevents a user's device from properly functioning until a fee is paid. It embeds in a way that it cannot be bypassed. Rebooting will not prevent it from running. This serious threat can mask as either a fictitious warning to blatant messages by the attackers. You will actually be working with one of the more infamous in this family want to cry in the lab. There's also crypto malware. It was deemed to be different than ransomware. Um, crypto, ra crypto malware and ransomware are basically one and the same as they both do the same job of finding a vulnerable system, encrypt the contents of the entire drive and ask for payment in order to decrypt the drive. We have the concealment family. This malware, specifically rootkit, avoids uh, detection from scanners. By accessing lower layers of the operating system or using undocumented functions to make alterations, Rootkits become undetectable by operating systems and common antivirus or anti-malware scanning software. As long as the rootkits files are hidden from the operating system, they'll be evaded, they'll evade detection. In the realm of payload capabilities, this malware family is known by what actions it can perform according to the contents of its payload. Some examples would be spyware, keyloggers, adware, logic bombs, backdoors, and bots. Spyware can download without the user's interaction, gather information about user's activity, including personally identifiable information or PII, and modify the user's configurations, such as home page, search page, default media player, etc. Keyloggers can be software or hardware based. Hardware keyloggers can function without detection by any software and can only be detected by physically scanning the USB port. or physically looking at it and seeing that there's something new. 
Oh, I see a question that I missed. What distinguishes ransom from crypto malware? Uh, ransomware and crypto malware basically do the same thing. It's really a difference in terms because with both of them, you have to pay in order to decrypt. So some of the early ransomware didn't decrypt everything or sorry, didn't encrypt everything whereas crypto malware did from the get-go. But things like WannaCry already do both. They both hold your system ransom and they encrypt all your files. So that the crypto malware term is kind of, kind of got thrown in um, and nothing really came of it because again, a lot of malware uses the functionalities that we're talking about here in one. Um, another is adware. It's a nuisance, displays objectionable content, interferes with the user's productivity, or slows or crashes the computer. Doesn't do much other than cause it to slow down. Logic bombs are hard to detect before they strike because they are embedded in large programs that aren't often scanned. Backdoors are easier to detect as long as a baseline exists of the system, then backdoors will stand out. So it is impossible to find a backdoor if you don't already know what protocols, what activity is normal because then you'll find the abnormal and find those backdoors quickly. Otherwise, it's just a needle in a haystack. Bots, or a botnet, receive their instructions from a command and control structure and execute those commands. I'm sure you have seen or heard of their effects when services are taken offline by hundreds of thousands of bots overwhelming them. Social engineering. This section exposes the underbelly of our digital security. Humans are the weakest link, yet they are most important part of your infrastructure. When planning your security posture, you must factor in your weakest link and how you will prevent successful attacks through this known weak spot of all organizations. Many social engineering attacks rely on psychology, the mental and emotional approach rather than the physical. At the center, this relies on an attacker's clever manipulation of human nature to persuade the victim to provide information or perform an action. Attackers have to gain the trust of their victims in a variety of techniques, such as authoritative, saying something like, I am the CEO, intimidation, things like, if you don't reset my password, then I'll speak to your supervisor, consensus, uh, last week your colleague helped me out, so why don't you help me? Scarcity, we can't waste time. This must be done immediately. Or familiarity, trust, or impersonation. Other factors that can also play a part are providing a reason. Attackers are careful to add a reason along with their request. Rationalization makes it more likely that a victim will be persuaded. Projecting confidence. Attackers generally do not create suspicion if they enter a restricted area, but calmly walk as though if they know where they're going, greeting people as they go. Evasion or diversion. When challenged, an attacker may evade questions by giving vague or irrelevant answers, feign innocence or confusion, or deny any allegations until the victim believes their suspicions are wrong. Attackers can also resort to anger and cause the victim to drop their challenge. Making people laugh. Humor is a natural way to let down defenses and build trust. 
and impersonation, masquerading as a real or fictitious person and play out that person's role on the victim, such as a repair person, IT support, manager, trusted third party, fellow employee. Plain authoritative figures generally works best as victims will rarely say no to someone in power. So some methods of social engineering are like phishing, one of the most common forms, requesting to update personal information like passwords, credit card numbers, SSN, bank account numbers. Uh, this is sent to millions of generic accounts. There's variations in the realm of phishing, like uh, spear phishing, targeting specific users, customized for the recipients, like their name, personal information, to make the message appear legitimate. There's whaling, which targets the bigger fish, like wealthy individuals, senior executives, and vishing with a V, using cell phone calls to do the same as electronic phishing. We also have spam, which we're very much used to. It continues to flood email inboxes, but email providers such as Gmail have artificial intelligence to detect and delete these emails from reaching the inbox. Hoaxes causing alarm to generate instant change in security configurations due to the messages warnings. And watering hole, finding a common website used by victim target group like vendor parts and infect that site in order to reach the target group. Uh, let me reshare my screen. Share sound. This awesome little clip. So I invited a few of the world's best hackers to try to hack me and show me where my vulnerabilities are. And now I'm going to meet them in Las Vegas for DEF CON, the biggest hacker convention of the year. They're going to hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and an internet connection. Do you want to do a sample of phishing call? What's fish? Best hacker? Phishing is voice solicitation. And basically um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Will okay. you, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go, go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. OK. Hi. I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me OK? I, my baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan, and we just had a baby, and he's like, get this done by today. So I'm so sorry. I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information, and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying, and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, at gmail .com. Jessica gets access to my personal email address. Now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah. Well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Shh. Oh, I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Jess uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number. 5127. To set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry. So there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Holy shit. So they they just gave they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're gonna have to go on and change your password now because it's Jess, my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yes. Is that not crazy or what? Sadly to say, I can say that's happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this video is kind of silly, but you can watch it if you want. Uh, this is the a small list of attacks based on physical. They take advantage of user actions or inactions 
that can result in compromised security. The first one being dumpster diving. This involves digging through the trash to find useful information for an attack. Though the trash may seem like an odd place to get information, many organizations throw calendars, USB drives, memos, organizational charts, phone directories, policy manuals, system manuals, and more in the trash without properly disposing of these papers through means of a shredder or defensive destruction. Knowing the schedule of an employee can help impersonate them. Gathering the system manuals can provide an insight into the technology within an organization. Tailgating is another realm in the physical. Securing buildings with expensive doors and locks is useless when an unauthorized person walks behind an authorized person before the door closes. A tailgater can impersonate someone, pretend to have an emergency or be pregnant or distract the authorized person and gain entry. If an authorized person conspires with an unauthorized person, that's called piggybacking. There's also shoulder surfing. By casually observing someone entering secret information, such as a pin code on an ATM pad or entry lock, a person can learn the necessary information to enter. This is true for passwords on a laptop in a public place or any other means. Shoulder surfing can be sophisticated using cameras or false pads placed on the legitimate pad. Um, any questions on the content? Cool. Let's make a new share to this. Um, number one, I have Google codes finally to issue out to everybody. So if you don't have them yet, please send me a message on Discord and I can get you some credits because you're going to need them for this lab. So I'm going to explain the lab, then I'll stop the recording and then we'll we'll just open it up to uh, questions and help because this, this is going to be a very specific set of instructions for a reason. Number one, you're going to need to create a N1 standard two system on GCP. You'll need to follow some specific steps to download uh, some content that you'll need. You'll connect to that system. Um, once you're in, you're going to import a virtual machine into it, and then you'll be able to drag and drop files in as needed. The reason why we're doing this, this whole big madness, is because we're working with dangerous malware. What you should be doing is you will be creating a virtual machine within a virtual machine in the cloud. That way, it does not in any way, shape, or form affect your local system. It's going to happen away on Google's data center, not on your local system. So this whole uh, prep is to do that, is to build a infrastructure where you can run your, your malware in a safe location outside of your local system. And this VM will also itself be enclosed so that nothing can get out into the world. Because the malware you will be working with is truly dangerous. Like I said, the first one that you're gonna be working with is WannaCry, the real WannaCry, not, not some fake malware that doesn't have any teeth or some unknown thing that doesn't do anything. You're actually working with the real thing. There is a guide that I provided here for you to follow directions once you're done uh, 
once you're done setting up that VM and you're inside of the Windows XP. You'll follow it step by step to get to the right place to not only, not only do you have to unzip the malware, then that's password protected, but you also have, uh, you also have to convert the, uh, the malware from its base 64 into the real thing, and then you will execute it. Once you execute WannaCry, it will infect that VM, that Windows XP VM. You'll want to reverse it using a tool called Wana Kiwi. Now, I will also let you know that Wana Kiwi is not 100% effective. And that is because of how WannaCry was built. WannaCry puts the decryption key inside of RAM, and it's only there for an hour. So you have a very small window to run Task Manager to find the, the processor ID for WannaCry, give that to WannaKiwi and have it run over through memory to find the key and decrypt all the files and finally stop WannaCry. Once that is done, the virtual machine is decrypted, but it's useless. At that point, you can destroy that VM and start all over using the instructions provided in the prep. So you'll do that uh, about a total of nine times because there, there are a couple of pieces of malware in, um, in here, in this in class, I believe if I'm not mistaken, there's like four or five. And then there's another uh, four or five sitting in the mod two lab. So you'll do it for both the in-class assignment and then also for the lab. So you're going to get a lot of hands-on experience with real malware. Questions on the overall scope of the lab, of the, of the work this week. I guess the only question is, how would we go about getting the, um, the credits for the uh, platform? All you need to do is send me a message on Discord. I have the sheet up, so I'll just issue you codes right away. All right, sounds good. Are there any main questions before we get started? Looking at my uh, chats, looking at my chats. Do we just start right here with setup or is there some pre-setup that I may not have done yet? Well, the pre-setup is putting your, uh, getting your GCP code from me so that you have $50 to spend on Windows VMs. Oh, okay. And the link to redeem those codes is in, in the uh, announcements, I believe. No, not the announcements. Where did I put them? I put the link to redeem those codes, I think in the home page. Yep, this one. So let me copy this and paste that. Oops, that's not what I want. I don't want the text. I want the link, copy link address. There it is in Zoom. I'll stick it in announcements. Thought I put it in. Oh, it is in announcements. Ha <laughs> ha. It's the last one that, that I put in announcements. All right, I see no main questions about the work ahead, so I'm gonna stop the recording.